just to make it maybe more uh, relevant or into the context of my way uh, for everyone is not maybe very well known yet because we're a pretty young company. We've been created back in the summer 2019 by Blackstone. And today it's actually a quite big company for a two year old company because we're 1,700 assets across 10 different regions. It's a portfolio that is more than 50 million square meters. Um, and we are very specialized in last mile logistics. So it's last mile logistic assets. The average size building is 10,000 square meters. Half of the portfolio has been built before 1990. We have 11,000 customers and tenants, so it's a very granular portfolio in that sense. Um, so we've been really much acquiring existing buildings. Now we're accelerating development of new projects. And I think this is making a lot of sense because that will put in perspective how ESG is actually ingrained in our business model because our whole value proposition is actually to take existing buildings, improve them, make them more attractive and competitive and desirable for customers. So improve their commercial value and then increase the value of the assets. And so this requires to make them more efficient, more, yeah, uh, future-proofed, resilient. Uh, and so that's why ESG is actually ingrained in our business model and business approach from the really start. Our motto is property starts with people and what has been driving attention to ESG in our company and you know what started that whole journey was really the people itself, the people that work at Tevils that have an intrinsic motivation to do something about the state of the planet, to do something about you know how they go about their work and um, especially with younger employees we see that a sense of purpose is really important. Obviously, next to that, we all, we all see the changes in regulation and legislation that are aimed our way uh, with the SFDR, the EU taxonomy, which a lot of our clients are coming to us now saying, so we know that there is something, but do you have any ideas how to get through it? Um, well, ESG criteria from our clients are obviously you know evolving where we used to be focused mostly on energy we now see a little bit of a shift towards bigger and more integral esg topics um well like judy already said the occupier demand so end users have increasingly uh, laid down some you know compliance measures for for esg and you know access to financing we see that there's a distinction between the amount of finance that people are willing to give you when you are less ESG compliant and a, and a preference towards assets that are ESG compliant or that have ESG credentials. We as consultants in, in the field of, of um, ESG, we probably have, have two views. We have the view on, on the market and of course we have a responsibility in our own um, company. I think if we look on the market, we can see a real difference in between the past and what we have today. I mean, the past sustainability was uh, was an option, not a duty. Um, it was principally driven by everyone's own uh, motivation. And um, often that was a marketing aspect, um, for example, through green building labels, or it was um, um, really clients who had a, a long-term vision where it was driven through the life cycle costs. I think today um, it has changed um, through or initiated by the um, UN Sustainability Development Goals, also the Paris Climate Agreement. We have seen that um, regulations appear, so it's not a, an, an option anymore. It really is, is a duty. We have uh, responsibilities regarding reporting. So in the end, we, we have to do something. And I think especially the European taxonomy is, is a big driver um, to answer your, your question on, on what is driving the market right now. Plus, as a second big driver, beside regulations, we see that doing nothing becomes a risk. Um, if, if assets are not compliant with regulations or with the European taxonomy, um, and you want to sell them in a couple of years, you, you lose a lot of, of buyers, of investors, because the funds behind them often have very clear requirements that an asset must be compliant to European taxonomy. Um, now we are in the UK. Um, Often we say after Brexit, we might not need to follow European taxonomy. I think that's wrong because most of invest or many investors in the UK are still coming from Europe. So it's a global topic. 
and um, it's it's relevant for everyone. Our own approach, um, what we do as as Dresden Summer, is being a consultant that field. Of course, we have a responsibility. We want to be a role model, so we have started um, our path to become a beneficial company. That means that we want to come to a point where we give back more to the environment we live in than we take from it. Um, that means we started with the roadmap of avoiding emissions, um, reducing emissions, and um, what we can't reduce, we compensate. And today we are carbon neutral by definition. I think we can even say we are climate positive, but to be fully transparent, that also depends on compensation measures, for example, for business travels. And I think the main challenge in the next year is to phase compensation out. I think that's on, on everyone's agenda when it comes to um, climate um, or being climate neutral. And that's going to be a, a big challenge and, and a really big task. Paulus is a um, pan-European real estate consultant. So we have offices throughout the UK and Europe. Um, so we see kind of different things in different locations. But I guess as a real estate consultant, I've kind of been in the sustainability space for over 10 years. And just kind of the change that has happened in the last 10 years, I think 10 years ago, you know, it was very niche. Maybe no one really wanted to speak about it. And the fact that we're even here today having this panel, all these people who are working in the same industry is just a super exciting opportunity for the industry and really great to see finally some change happen, um, some positive change in that way. So that's really good. And I think that comes kind of from three main things that we've identified that's that's moving that. The first one being legislation. So as a lot of people touched on, of course, you know, there's a lot of European legislation that's really driving that. And I would say for maybe even 80% of our clients, that's still the main reason that they're coming to us is because legislation is provoking them to do something. They know that they're at um, risk for the future of not being able maybe to use their assets or for their assets to become stranded assets. And that's kind of the first thing that they're um, protecting against and why they're kind of interested in learning more about ESG. And then after that, I would say we have a lot of clients who are interested in even doing better than legislation, kind of seeing how can they future-proof into the future, what can be done to you know uh, outperform kind of the guidelines from legislation. And you see that not only from people intrinsically kind of wanting to do better, but just the way that the market is moving, um, different uh, guidance is going about things like net zero or, or social impact, um, things like that. And then I think lastly, of course, it's you know it's not only our clients, their intrinsic goals, but what are their clients' goals? So there are people are coming to them and saying, well, we'd like to invest in you, we want to invest in your fund, but what are you guys doing about ESG? And that maybe is the first time that someone's even being asked this question. So it sparks a lot of ideas and questions in their mind as well. Um, you know, what can we be doing to kind of change our uh, ESG metrics or improve our ESG impact? Um, so I think those are kind of the three main drivers that we're seeing to, to alter the focus.